It's a very bold question that confronts us in the gospel today. Who do you say that I am? It's a bold question for Jesus to ask because at that time, in that culture, in that world, to know someone's name was to have control of them, was to have power over them. Now, in our day and age, when our name is public record and it might be splashed all over social media, if you're on Facebook, we might think, well, isn't that quaint? Isn't that charming that they thought that if you knew somebody's name, you had control over them? Well, I'd like to do, to do a little experiment. In just a few minutes, the ushers are going to come through the congregation. They're going to pass out little three-by-five cards and a pencil. And I'm going to ask you three questions, and then they'll collect them and they'll give them to me. And the three questions are these. What is your name? What is your birth date? What are the last four digits of your social security number? <laughs> if I have that information, do you think I have power over you? <laughs> or at least some of your finances. So maybe it isn't just so quaint or charming when we want to know somebody, when we want to know their name. We live in a culture, or again, our Western culture emphasizes so much unique individuality, the absolute primacy of the individual uniqueness. But really, the, the world that Jesus was in, and, and perhaps a healthier worldview, a more holistic worldview, saw personality is being dyadic. In other words, you're not an isolated atom just out there somewhere forming yourself, but you get your identity from your relationships, from family, from clan, from nation, from religion. That's what forms you. Just look at our experience as individuals. Look at your toddlers, it, newborns. They start from the very beginning hearing their name called by people who love them. And then they start to interact, whether it's playing hide and seek or whether it's responding or not responding to that call. That's how they pick up their personality, by that interaction. And then, then, then it's first parents and then siblings and then they go off to school and the circles continue to become wider and wider. The toddler learns gradually and we still do when we're senior citizens, hopefully, to know who we are because of our interactions. The great Jewish philosopher Martin Buber said that the self can only be discovered and defined in relationship to the other. In his book, in his seminal book, I and Thou, he said, to be is to be in relationship. To exist is to have to exist in relationship. There's a wonder, there was a wonderful movie back out, I think in the early 70s, called Papillon. It was about French uh, prisoners at Devil's Island. And in one scene, one wonderful scene, uh, Dustin Hoffman playing Louis Degas comes out of months of solitary confinement and he rushes up to his friend Henri Carrière, who's played by Steve McQueen, and he grabs him and he says, can you see me? Can you see me? He wants to know if he really exists, that, that, that someone else can respond to him. And this is how it is, even in the scriptures, Jesus is asking us this. You know, sometimes I think we think that Jesus, when he was in Bethlehem, laying in the cradle, was going, hmm, 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 hmm. 33 years and I can get out of this dump, huh? go back to heaven. No, St. Luke tells us quite clearly in the second chapter, Jesus grew in wisdom age and grace. Jesus grew like all of us grew in an understanding of who he was and what he was to do. Scripture scholar says that this passage, this passage where Jesus is saying, who do people say that I am? It's not just a pop quiz. It's not just a midterm exam. It's Jesus also having a deeper understanding of what his identity is, his role as Messiah and his mission as Savior. So we see this here, and then there's this reciprocity, because it's not Jesus who just asks the question, but there's a change in Peter. Peter answers the questions, of course, as Peter always does so impetuously. You're, you're, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ of God. And of course he's right, but he doesn't understand what it means. But then Jesus takes Simon, son of Jonah, and says, that's not who you're going to be anymore. You're going to change too. You're going to be Peter. You're going to be the rock upon whom I build my church. And so we have this invitation today in the scriptures to do the same. 
to interact with people and to draw our identity out and to invite them. And in this exchange, we can either empower others to become the people they are called to be by God, or we can impede them from doing this. We can empower them by respecting them, by supporting them, by encouraging them, or we can impede them from their growth by degrading them, by scorning them, by discouraging them. And we can do this with individuals in our lives, and we can do it with groups. We can do it within our home, we can do it within our school, we can do it within our place of work, where we empower people or we stunt people. And we can do it with social groups, when we label them as the other, when we label them with some, some minor characteristic, or when we narrow them to one category of, of color or race or ethnicity or economic bracket or social, social status or sexual orientation. We can just pigeonhole them. There's a wonderful story that's been going around on the internet for over 10 years. I'm not sure it's a true story, but as the Italians say, non è vero e ben trovato, which means if it's not a true story, it should be, because it's a good story. <laughs> I want to try to abbreviate it and tell you about this, because I think it exemplifies what I'm talking about, about the power that we have to enable people to grow into the people that Jesus calls them to be. It's the story of a teacher named Mrs. Thompson who had a little boy in her fifth grade class named Teddy Stoddard. And Teddy Stoddard was not a particularly attractive student to her. She had taught for a few years and she was pretty proficient at it. And here was this boy who was always dirty and sullen and falling asleep and not wanting to participate. And she actually took some guilty delight in being able to put a big red F at the top of his papers. But then one day she decided to look into his background, so she reviewed some of his records, and this is what she found. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and has good manners. He's a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he's troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, his mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest, and his home life will soon affect him if some steps aren't taken soon. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in class. He doesn't have many friends, and he sometimes sleeps in class. It all came to a head at Christmas time, the last day of class when children were bringing Mrs. Thompson their Christmas gifts, and Teddy brought one too, but it was unlike the others that were brightly wrapped with ribbons, it was kind of clumsily wrapped in a grocery bag. She opened it in the middle of the pile of presents, and she took out a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing, and a half-used bottle of perfume. The kids started to laugh, but she went on to put on the bracelet and dab some perfume on her wrists. After class, Teddy came, Teddy came to her and said, you smell good, you smell like my mother the last time we had at Christmas. She spent special time after that. Teachers aren't supposed to have pets, but Teddy became hers, and she lavished extra effort. And by the end of the semester, by the end of that school year, he was at the top of the class. And he went on to finish grade school, and when he finished grade school, he wrote her a note and said, Mrs. Thompson, you're the best teacher I've ever had. And then after four years of high school, she received another note slipped under her door, Mrs. Thompson, you're still the best teacher I have ever had. And after college, another note came and said, it was hard, but I did it. And I did it because you're the best teacher I've ever had. And after four more years, she got another elegantly penned note. And at the bottom was a different name. It said, Theodore Stoddard, MD. The story doesn't end there. You see, a couple years later, Teddy Stoddard was getting married. And he asked Mrs. Thompson to sit in the place that his mother would have sat in. And she came and she wore the rhinestone bracelet and made sure she found the same perfume that he had given her many years before. When he came into the church, he found her and hugged her and whispered, thank you, this all happened because of you. And she said, no, thank you, Teddy. I became a teacher because of you. I used to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic, but because of you, I was able to teach children. That's the kind of power that each one of us has over others whether we're a teacher, a boss, a spouse, a parent, a child, a friend, a colleague, or even a stranger. We can see another person, 
or we can miss seeing them. They can be so close to us and they can be invisible. We can call them forth to be the best person they can be or we can keep them locked away. You see, Jesus said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. But it's not just the reference as we always give it to the sacrament of penance, to reconciliation and absolution. No, each one of us has those keys to, to let other people go free, to become the glorious people, the glorious sons and daughters that God enables them to be. Each person we see really silently asks us the question, do you see me? Can you see me? Who do you say that I am? Who do you enable me to be? Let's stand and pray.